Now, once we've defined that, now we can just use the same tools we already learned the last couple lectures. We can just optimize. We have some indifference curve where people have a utility that's defined over, they have utility, which is u of consumption and leisure. Let's call it n like Perloff does. Okay? They have utility over consumption and leisure. Okay? And they just maximize that with respect to this budget constraint. So this indifference curve gives you the, is, comes out of these preferences. We know how to solve for that. We know that the optimum is the tangency between the indifference curve and the budget constraint. So we can solve for the optimal amount of leisure. And having solved for that, we can use this formula, technical formula, to go back and solve for the optimal amount of labor. And that's how we figure out how hard you're going to work. So I've just told you how to use the tools that we developed in consumer theory to determine how hard, uh, how hard individuals are going to work. Yeah? Uh, so I'm sorry, like is PX leisure or? PX, this is the general form. PX would be W. That's the price of leisure. Right. Okay. So PX would be W. Okay? That, that's the price of leisure. The, the slope of the budget constraint is the ratio of those two prices. The price of leisure. So this is 1 and this is W. So, so is it leisure over goods or goods over leisure? Well, it's, it's, it, we typically write it as uh, we typically write it as, as leisure over goods. We typically write it as the price of the good on the x-axis over the price of the good on the y-axis because of the we define the slope of the budget constraint. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> All right. So now, since you understand that, now we get to talk about why income and substitution effects are so interesting. Okay. And to do that, we look at Figure Seven Two. And look at income and substitution effects on the leisure decision and therefore the labor supply decision. So let's start with an initial budget constraint, BC1. Individuals are choosing to work and to take N1 hours of leisure, therefore 24 minus N1 hours of work, and consume C1. See that at point A. Now let's imagine the wage rate goes up. The wage rate goes up, so the slope steepens. Okay, the wage rate goes up, so this is a steeper slope now this budget constraint. When that wage rate goes up, you end up working, you end up taking fewer hours of leisure, you shift from N1 to N3, and consuming more point C. So it's sort of the natural thing. You get paid more, so you work harder, right? You get paid more, you take less leisure, you work harder. But now let's break that down income substitution effects. The substitution effect is the price of leisure has gone up, which by definition has to lead you to take less leisure. That's definitional. Zero it's, or non-positive. It, it can't lead you to increase. It typically leads you to decrease. So you will move from point N1 to point N2. So remember how we get that. We draw that imaginary budget constraint that intersects the original indifference curve. So imagine budget constraint is BC star. That intersects the original indifference curve at point B. So the substitution effect is moving from point A to point B. Yeah? Question for you. So if you're making more money, wouldn't you want to work less since you're getting? Great question. Great question. So now let's come to the income effect. The income effect, you're talking about extreme case, we'll get to in one minute. But the income effect, typically for a normal good, remember, work the same direction as the substitution effect. Here, the income effect works in the opposite direction of substitution effect. Why is that? Why does the income effect go the opposite direction? Why? Yeah? Because usually it works out that you feel poorer when prices go up and now you feel richer. Exactly. Because the price going up makes you richer. And if you're richer, you want more of everything, including leisure. So here, the price increase doesn't go to the producer of pizza and movies. It goes to you. So the price going up makes you richer which means you want more leisure. So now the effects conflict. On the one hand, every hour you work, you take home more money. You're thinking, gee, I want to work more. On the other hand, you're thinking, wow, I'm, all the hours I worked already, I'm richer. I want to work less. And those conflict. Okay? And in fact, you can get, as in figure 7.3, as was suggested up here, you could actually get the income effect dominating the substitution effect. Now, once again, I haven't mentioned inferior goods here. There's nothing about giving goods to inferior. This is all normal. Okay? But it's, you can actually get the income effect where the wage goes up 
and leisure goes up or labor supply goes down. That is, you work less at a higher wage. And the instincts, why don't you explain your intuition for that? What, why do you think that might be natural? What? No, go ahead. <laughs> I totally blanked out. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, okay. So basically, what, the, the reason that we think that that might, the reason we think that that might actually not be a crazy case is because people might have, for example, a target income. So imagine, for example, you're working, you, you know, you're a 16 year old, and the only reason you're working is because you want to buy, a, you know, a bike. Okay. You want a 16 year old, you want to buy a bike, and the bike's a thousand bucks. <laughs> Okay? And you're making 10 bucks an hour, so you know you have to work 100 hours to get it. Now suddenly I raise your rate, wage to 20 bucks an hour. You work less, because you don't like working. You work for any other reason other than to get the bike. So you can make enough money for the bike now in 500 hours. You don't need to work th you know, in, in uh, 50 hours. You don't need to work 100 hours. So if you have target income, by definition, the income effect dominates the substitution effect. Okay. So now I'm not saying that's a general case. I'm just saying that's the way I like to think of the intuition here. I find this very hard, this intuition of income effects going the other way is substitution effects. And I find the useful way to think about it is think about the target income case, which is based on the notion that, look, why wouldn't income effects dominate substitution effects? If you're someone who has a goal on how much you want to make, then when the wage goes up, you work less, not more. So it's ambiguous which way that goes. It's ambiguous which way that goes. So basically, if the, so the bottom line is, if the wage goes up, okay, if the wage goes up, then there's a substitution effect, which we know leads leisure to go down, leisure to go down, which means it leads hours of work to go up. That has to happen by the substitution effect. But we also know there's an income effect which does what? What does the income effect do? So raise your hand and tell me. What's the income effect do here? Yeah. Number of hours of leisure goes up. Number of hours of leisure goes up? Maybe. Maybe not. What's the case in which it wouldn't? Can, remember, can anyone think? You're right in general, but there's one particular case where that wouldn't be true, which we talked about last time. What about what if, under what conditions? What about leisure would make it not go up? Like if it's an inferior good. So actually, there's an uncertain effect on leisure, and therefore an uncertain effect on hours. It depends if, it depends if leisure's normal or inferior. I assumed it was normal so far. So if leisure's normal, if leisure's normal, then n goes up, OK? And that leads h to go down, and the net is ambiguous. Okay, so here the net, so the substitution was always h goes up. So here the net is ambiguous. Okay, but if it's inferior, then n is going to go down, which means h will go up, which means clearly h will go up from the wage change. OK, so let me go through it again. The substitution effect is when the wage goes up, you take less leisure and work more. The income effect is uncertain. If it's a normal good, you take more leisure and work less, and that offsets the substitution effect, leading to an uncertain net outcome, as we showed in those two figures. But if it's an inferior good, leisure would go down, and that worked the same direction as the substitution effect, so hours would definitely go up. So going back to last time, with, with movies and pizza. If leisure's inferior, then we're in the same case we were before where goods were normal. It's the flip. Before, when goods were inferior, we got the uncertain case of the gift, possible given good. Okay? Here, that's the normal case. And the unusual case is where actually you get uh, a certain outcome. Okay? <coughs> Questions about that? So basically, the bottom line is we don't know what's going to happen when the wage goes up. And I think your intuition can work both ways. You can think, woo, I'm making more, I'm going to work harder. Woo, I'm making more, I can work less. And it's not clear which way that's going to go. OK? So basically, you see in figure 7.2 and 7.3, two different cases for where leisure's a, nor for where leisure's a normal good. OK? And it's not clear which way that's going to end up. Now, 
Let's go back to imagining leisure as a normal good. And let's go back to the case economists typically think of. Let's imagine substitution effects dominate. Okay. Let's assume for a minute substitution effects dominate. Then we can go to figure 7-4, which shows us how to draw a labor supply curve. Remember, we used the labor supply curve way back in the second lecture. We talked about the minimum wage. We had a labor supply curve, remember? Well, here's where it comes from. First of all, you have a consumer choice problem. The wage goes up, and people move from A to B. So I'm assuming substitution effects dominate. That is, as the wage goes up, people want less leisure and more hours. You can draw that down to draw a graph in leisure wage space, which shows a downward sloping demand for leisure curve. As the price of leisure goes up, which is the wage, you want less of it. You invert that through this formula, through 24 minus n, OK? And you end up saying you end up with an upward sloping labor supply curve. And that's where labor supply comes from. OK? So the bottom line is, if substitution effects dominate, or if, or if, or if leisure is an inferior good, if either substitution effects dominate and leisure is a normal good, or if leisure is an inferior good, then you'll get an upward sloping labor supply curve. But if it was the case that income effects dominated, you would get a, what we call a backward bending or downward sloping labor supply curve, where a higher wage would lead to less work. Okay? And that would be true. And now you, see, you know that's not implausible. That's just saying income effects are dominating. Okay? Questions about that? 